pledge or not? I think we can do the pledge, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to flag, but we'll try it. Ready? I yeah. pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Yeah. That was interesting. <laughs> okay, Rebecca, would you like to read the public input statement? Yes. Um, the first public input session is a 15 minute session with each person having no longer than three minutes in which to make a statement. A second input session may be held at the end of the meeting if it is allowed by the board chair. Each speaker will give his or her name, address, and reason for speaking. <laughs> Public input is designated for district residents, but the board chair may grant non-residents the opportunity to address the board. Please note that statements involving certain subject matters, such as personnel, cannot be made during these public input sessions. Public input can be made in person during board meetings and or submitted by email through the link at the top of each meeting agenda found on the district website. Emailed statements will be read during the first input session at the beginning of board meetings. Thank you. If anyone else oh. is... Was that, what was that thing? Oh, she's frozen. She's frozen. Yeah, just me. All right, I'm gonna go off video. Okay. Do we want to read the ones you already have first? So, and then get to the people that are in person, or? I think that we can let the folks that are here start, and then we can wrap up with the, we have six at this moment in time, we have six that we'll read out loud. So if folks want to come that are here first to read, that's, that's fine. Okay. Uh, right here is fine? Sure. Okay. You just need to state who you are and what, tell me your problem. Okay, my name is Bruce Jackson, I'm from Lebanon, and I have two children in the school district. I'd like to start off tonight by um, saying both of my children love school and that they've always liked their teachers and both my wife and I have as well. I think that's important for you to know. Um, the improvements of my son's learning disabilities has been absolutely amazing. Um, so I'd really like to thank all the hardworking folks at MS 860 and their teachers as well. With the initial panic of the pandemic last year, we thought that the district did an adequate job of keeping the kids safe. My kids obviously did not want to wear masks, but they did anyway. They really wanted to be at school with all their friends. Last year, my kids were taught at school that being healthy meant masking, using lots of hand sanitizer, no laughing or singing because that spreads COVID, no talking at lunch and staying away from their friends. There was little to no mention of exercise, eating healthier, building a strong immune system. Now that so much has come to light, I strongly would like to urge you to consider very hard the decisions you're going to be making regarding these children's future. These decisions not only affect them physically, but very much mentally. Most of last year's actions in the name of safety are no longer appropriate. We know that this virus is not affecting children like initially thought. We know that older folks, anybody 12 plus has had the opportunity to get vaccinated. And we know that if you wanna wear a mask, you have that right and you have that choice to wear one. So tonight I'm gonna to urge you to reject mandatory masking. The majority of people now agree that masking is political theater. These, these masks restrict oxygen and they're dirty, immense other problems. Above all else, it's mentally affecting our children negatively. Do these physical, these, uh, psych sorry, uh, apologize. Do these psychological games that are being played on these kids, I'd like to know how much the teen suicide rate has increased. What about drug abuse and overdoses in the district? The solution can't be worse than the problem. So go ahead and listen to the mask recommendation from the three letter agency, but know that the right answer is to allow the parents to choose. Go forward, but know that, go forward, but know what your role is and please know where the line is. The decisions you're gonna make will be judged on 
and now is the time to decide in what side of history you want to be on. It's not just about masking. Please don't try to limit our freedoms. You have the choice to do the right thing. Thank you for your service and your support in these tough times. That's all. All right. Thank you very much. All set. Yes. Uh, uh, my name is Brian Kelly. Uh, I live here in North Barwick. Um, I also have two children. Um, my son is about to enter second grade. Um, and my daughter, my youngest, she's about to go into kindergarten. Um, both my children love school. My daughter is very excited to uh, start coming to the big school with her big brother. Um, and my main concern, uh, same as yours, is the, uh, the mass mandate that I, mean, um, I don't agree with it. Um, don't be saying that kids can't wear masks. If, if that's what you want to do for your child, by all means, you know, let them wear a mask, but you shouldn't be forcing other parents to have their kids wear masks if they don't want to. Um, it's factual that masks don't stop the spread of the disease. Um, I've got a few examples here, uh, taken from the packaging of N95 masks and multiple packages of masks that are sold at your local pharmacies. All of them have warnings on them that state uh, that they do not stop infectious disease, um, such as the COVID variant. So um, there's really no benefit, um, especially for our young kids. Um, the mental image we're putting them through, um, you know, the psychological damage, um, like you mentioned, the suicide rates uh, with the teens in high school, um, it's just not worth it. Um, I noticed with my son, when he was entered into kindergarten, he absolutely loved school. He'd come home happy, telling us all about his day. And then at the end of last year, um, going through the remote learning and being able to go in part time, uh, having to wear a mask when he was in school. Um, both my wife and I noticed uh, just a dramatic drop in his joy at school. Uh, he had nothing to talk about when he came home. Um, it's just not worth it. It's not worth it to take away kids' childhood, their enjoyment of school, um, see their friends' faces, seeing smiles. Um, and even on the teachers, I remember the teacher talking about how she missed seeing the kids' smiles and stuff. Um, so as an adult, you have the option to go and get your vaccinations. You have the option to wear your mask if that's what makes you feel safe. You can let your kid wear a mask if that helps you feel safe as well. Um, but a lot of the parents that um, don't want to put their child through this uh, to have the option not to have them wear their masks. Thank you. Did you all, were you able to hear that pretty clearly? Yes. Okay. Thank you. The little low voice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I'll share the six public inputs that I have here. Um, the first is from Danielle Minuti of North Berwick. I know tonight's topic is tough and nobody wants to mask up again, but I support universal masking in schools regardless of vaccine status. It is the best chance we have to remain in person as there will be no distancing and this is now one of the most contagious viruses known. I want very much for my own kids to be in person and for me to teach my students in person. It is a minor convenience in the grand scheme of things so that we can get these kids back to school. Thank you. Okay, the second one. Uh, this is from Melissa Cormier of Berwick. I am writing to say masks should not be mandated in school this year for any age group. My daughter, junior this year, is trying to refuse to go back to school if masks are mandated. She says it's terrible having to wear a mask all day long. She'd rather do remote learning. <clears throat> this is coming from a girl who intensely disliked remote learning. The decision about wearing masks should be left to the parents of each child in the school system. We as parents should be the ones who decide the best health practices for our children, no one else. Our children should not have to struggle to breathe fresh air for five or six hours per day while sitting in a classroom trying to learn. They're right as humans, American citizens, and God's children to breathe freely. They should not have to ask permission to take a mask break so they can easily breathe. What are we not seeing our healthy children from? 
At Ryerson has a fatality rate of 0.05% in persons 70 years old or older. It compares rather closely to the fatality rate of the regular flu, yet we don't ask our healthy children for that. Let's look at the numbers in our own state. As of August 3rd, 2021, across the entire state of Maine, we've had a seven-day average of 90 new cases with only two fatalities since May or June. We should not be masking our children over two fatalities. Yes, we're seeing a spike in cases, nothing like the height of the pandemic, but we're not seeing a rise in fatalities. Children and adolescents have an extremely adaptive immune system with a robust response to most illnesses, but their immune systems need to be exposed to everyday germs. Their immune system needs to be challenged to be so adaptive and robust. Placing masks on our children and teens is not good for the physical well-being and immune response. One of my biggest issues with mandating masks in schools or at all is we are teaching our children to live in fear. Environmental health issues, uh, for instance, anxiety. For children ages 5 to 11, there was a 25% increase in mental health issues and a 31% increase for ages 12 to 17. This is not okay. We should be reinforcing the notion they are healthy and strong, that it is extremely unlikely that, that they get the virus, and if they do get it, they will survive it with ease. I acknowledge there are some exceptions due to other vulnerabilities. Instead of instilling fear and worry, we should be teaching them how to feed their bodies properly, what we all can do to boost our immune response. Um, we should teach our children what a healthy diet versus a poor diet can do to our bodies, and how it can help fight out most illnesses just by eating right. Teach them how to exercise and, and teach them about it. meditation is also important, along with a strong sense of spirituality. All these items will boost their overall sense of well-being and immune response to any illness. We can't keep asking our children in an attempt to eradicate COVID-19. It is not going to happen. COVID-19 will most likely be a seasonal illness. I am saying it is okay to go against the suggested guidance to fight for what is right for our children, to know that we can't continue to mask our children and let this virus control our children's lives and education. Our own DHHS commissioner, Jean Lembrough, said, mask guidance in schools preserve the rights of local districts to make their own decisions. Lewiston School Committee voted to make masks optional. They agree that the decision should be up to parents. Sad City should do the same and make its own decision not to mask our children. Thank you for your time. Concerned parents of two current high school students, Melissa and Jim. And this one is from Lindsay Kelper from North Berwick. Hello, I want to start by thanking you for how well you handled a challenging school year last year. As plans for next year are being made, I want to put forth a recommendation for universal masking to be mandated in our schools especially for those children under 12 who are too young to be vaccinated. Delta variant is much more contagious. Given that distancing requirements are being relaxed, I worry that we are putting our most vulnerable population at risk. Simply recommending that masks be worn is not enough. Masks mostly protect those around the world, making the argument that families can choose for themselves a risky decision. I urge for you to follow the American Academy of Pediatrics and CDC guidelines as you make health and safety decisions for the upcoming school year. Thank you. And this is from Michelle Frampton of Lebanon. I hope the district takes the guidelines suggested by medical professionals seriously when going forward and planning what the 2021-22 school year will look like. I also hope the school will make proper accommodations for families like mine who have a child with a compromised immune system and health risks health issues who are at risk. This is from Kathy Sheedy of Berwick. My hope this year is that we can get back to having all students back at school 100% of the time. If they need to wear masks in order to do that, I would fully support that option, as would my student who will be a senior this year. Although she was fully vaccinated, she would wear a mask if she was asked to. She has had to wear a mask in order to work and understand the importance of keeping others safe. Our final public input is not related to this necessarily. This is from Marie Gillis of Berwick. And her question is, what kind of presence do you foresee PTO having in the schools this year, like being in the building, running fundraisers, or events? Good question. <laughs> We're hoping to 
allow that to move forward again, right? To have our PTOs back in place. Right, so that is the conclusion of public input at this point. We will check it in again at the end of it to see if anybody else. Okay, okay. thank you to everybody. Um, let's move right into it and uh, see what the CD recommendations are from Amy. Hi. All right, before we start, I just kind of want to set the stage. Uh, thank you for meeting tonight. We had received some information last week that we thought we wanted to share in a timely manner rather than waiting till our August 18th date. We just wanted to share everything with you that we heard at the um, Dr. Shaw's news conference last week, plus um, just an update on area superintendents and what school districts um, are kind of looking at right now, just to give our board and our community just an update on all that information. Um, so we've asked Amy to join us just to kind of summarize where we were, what the information is right now, and then just to, to start those conversations. Right. So my name is Amy Creighton, I'm the director of the Center here at SAD 16, I'm also a school nurse in high school. Um, so like I just said, I kind of want to give... Excuse me? Um, Could I ask that you speak up a little bit and speak a little slower? Sure. Okay. So, like I said, I'm going to give a little bit of a recap of where we started last year, how we moved through the year, and where we are now with what's come up. So um, last year, Maine had developed a return to school plan ahead of any federal guidance that had come out. Um, and then these were guidelines that we were required to follow. Um, so we did. So these things included masking, distancing, uh, symptom screening at home, hand hygiene, PPE, and re returning to school after illness. Uh, we followed these guidelines in each edition as they were added and as the years, a year progressed. Towards the spring, some of the requirements and mandates were lifted by Governor Mills, such as the travel restrictions um, and masking outdoors, which we adjusted to as well. At the end of June, the governor ended the state of emergency, ending the masking mandate for schools leaving it as highly encouraged for unvaccinated people to wear masks while indoors. Of course, we were already out of school at that point, um, but that is how we operated our summer programs this year. Um, recently, Maine announced that they have dissolved our pre-K to 12 guidance that we followed last year, and that we will now begin following what the US CDC has put out for guidance. Um, in those documents, three major takeaways from what the US CDC has put out is the requirement to mask on public transportation. So that includes school buses. So we did that. We did that this summer. That's not negotiable. Um, also, there's a recommendation for all people, regardless of vaccination status, to wear masks while in indoor public settings in communities with substantial or high community transmission. And then third, they recommended that all teachers, staff, students in K-12 schools wear masks regardless of vaccination status or the community transmission level. Last week, Sue, Audra, and I attended a remote meeting for superintendents, administrators, and nurses where Dr. Shaw and others from the DHHS and the DOE spoke about um, the increases of COVID cases, the Delta variant, pool testing, and acknowledging that things change quickly, and he, Dr. Shaw, had even said what he knew, knew two weeks ago is not what he knows now. So things are always subject to change. And of course, they encouraged the universal masking in schools um, that was put out in the US CDC guidance. Um, another thing that was uh, discussed, and this, was, this is a requirement of us, is that beginning in September, Maine DHHS will be collecting school staff vaccine rates, much much like they do for healthcare settings, um, and they post it on a dashboard. How we will be reporting that is yet to be determined. I haven't seen how that will happen. Um, if it'll be voluntary, just you know, click here, if you're vaccinated or not, or if we have to see cards, not quite sure. Um, they will also start posting youth vaccine rates categorized by SAU every two weeks, and that is to start in August at some point. 
Uh, the hope is that by collecting this data, by improving it by SAU, it will help to bring clinics to areas where vaccine rates are low. They are also willing to work with schools for pop-up vaccine clinics. And then also last week, um, Sue and Audra met with uh, area superintendents remotely to kind of discuss where are we at. So we met with the York County and the Cumberland County uh, superintendents for the SAUs and SABs and RSUs. And really, we, we kind of unpacked some of Dr. Shaw's comments from the day before and talked a little bit about where different districts were in, in the process. And it really is a smattering of recommend, recommending, keeping that recommendation, mandating, and then some a fair amount of districts haven't yet met with boards or um, have plans to do so in a couple of weeks. So there really isn't a ton of consistency among what York County's doing, what Cumberland County's doing. It really is it's split. pretty much split. Right. So so we put we put it up on our board. One of the reasons we can't like just give you names of districts is because some of these folks haven't actually met with their own board yet. So, but this is their this is the conversation we had that was sort of like an informal. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? So, there were. Um, if I think about your kind of think about like looking at the picture of the board, I might actually take down. But there was there are about um, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's like um, twelve systems that we talked to in York County alone. Four of them were going to mandate this. Four of them were unsure at this time about leaning that way, and four of them were going to stick to the recommendations, like being recommended only. And then in Cumberland County, we were missing a few because we're not as involved with them as, as, as York County. And it felt almost similarly, except that there were uh, four on the mandating side. There was one that was um, sort of in the middle, not sure yet, and then there were three on the recommendation side. So. Clearly, we're all the same place. We're all like, what's the best thing to do? T totally understanding and hearing what our folks in person tonight said, public input wise. Understanding what we're hearing in a, you know in the other one. It's it's very split. So the board has um, we just have some some work to do in terms of what is what's what's next, right? It's not, it's not an easy answer at all. And that's why we're having the meeting, just for like a real initial conversation about any kind of questions that we may have. Um, we have Amy here for any questions. We did want to talk a little bit about summer programming and how that went. And, um, and we have a board meeting August 18th as well. So we, we have some time here to to continue to collect information, to continue to listen to our community members and our parents. Um, so I guess that's it. So programming, Amy, do you want to talk a little bit about how that went? Right, so like I said, at the time, um, we were under the recommendation to wear a mask, keep the mask. Um, after speaking, uh, did you get the numbers of like our uh, program, we kiddos were in our programs, I remember exactly, but. Um, there were very few children who chose to come to school with masks, um, and we had one case um, with no spread um, that I've been alerted to by the CDC, and um, yeah, so, That's good. and the kids, yep. when we announced that oh, we have to now mask on buses, it was like, that next Monday, we they were, fine. they were fine. We supplied the masks on the buses, and um, they did what they needed to do. I've got a question. Um, have you heard anything about 12 and under for the vaccine? Because I've heard different things that completely change. From what I've heard, well, the first thing I heard that would come next would be um, FDA approval of the Pfizer, um, and then. As far as the five to eleven group, that would be sometime maybe this winter. Okay. So not soon enough. Great. 
Is that what you're hearing also? Yeah, and someone the other day said something about September. I'm like, huh, I hadn't heard that. I've heard more along the lines of December and possibly January, February. Like early 22. Yeah. <clears throat> we are going to have a vaccine clinic here August. It, yes. Tentatively, August 12th and September 2nd, um, hosted by York County Emergency Room. That was like today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the last time we had a clinic for our students, we had about 200. Yep. Yes. Yes. Can you still came and helped us out with that one? About 200. That was just for students. Um, this next one is open to community members. So if a family's bringing their kids, mom, dad, grandma, bring one, bring all. And we did a little uh, survey for our staff, just because I know that's always a question for us that we've had throughout the spring. And um, as of right now, we have 521 responses from our staff, and we are currently at 91% vaccinated. And so just for folks who don't, we have about 650 employees, so 522 of those. So sorry, is the 91% of the ones that responded or of our total? No, that would be 91% of the 522 who responded. Okay, so what does that equal? I could do the math, I guess. Yeah, we have a few people that have not responded yet, but oh, there are maybe. still okay. doing other things. <laughs> Um, I, and it, maybe I didn't hear it right, but Amy, could you just go over, did you say there were three things that were mandated? I'm a little confused. Are they mandated? Are they recommended? The CDC is mandating, but the state is recommending. I'm confused. So <laughs> the mandates right now are to mask on buses and that, um, well, this one doesn't quite go with schools, but it's also a mandate that, uh, actually, the recommendation, sorry, for all people, regardless of vaccination, to wear masks while in indoor public settings in communities with substantial or high community transmission. So that's the US CDC's recommendation. Okay. Um, and then they also recommend that teachers staff and students in all K-12 schools wear masks regardless of vaccination status or community transmission level. But that, that's also a recommendation? That's a recommendation. The other requirement for us is the reporting of the staff vaccine rates. Well, I have a problem. How, how can you do that with HIPAA and you can't require people to give you that answer, can you? Apparently we can. So I have a question about that, Amy, because the state, I mean, the, you know, the referendum that we had a couple of years ago, we literally mandated that everybody, you couldn't come to school unless you were up on your vaccinations. That got put on hold. And now we're sort of at a point where it seems like we're not even allowed to ask the vaccination status because it's a different vaccination. So can you help me understand how we've sort of gone from literally requiring it to even walk in the door that would have been implemented this September to like, it's not, we're not even allowed to ask it. It's two totally different um, topics. So the one that you're, the one is all of our state required vaccines that are required to enter into a public school. So it's just a different vaccine, that's all. Like that's, it's just that this one is not on the list. This one is not on the list. Okay. So that's the only difference, though. It's not like, conceptually, it's not different. It's just not a vaccine that's listed on that. Correct. So how does that become a HIPAA violation just because it's not, and you know what, that, never mind, that doesn't matter, but I... <laughs> it's the same with the flu vaccine. You can't, it's not on the list. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. They're for emergencies only, correct? Yeah. Right. It's not even an it's experiment. <laughs> And, and do you know, Amy, if if this was man, if this was approved by the FDA, um, like what? How does a vaccine get on that list that is mandated? A law, 
which takes a lot of time. So, you know, FDA approval, um, recommendations that such and such age group get it by the AAP, those type of folks. Um, and then it would take leaders at the state level to say, hey, we want this to now join our list of other school required vaccines. And it would have to become a law, which I. So when we voted on that, um, I didn't remember the wording, but it sounds like when we voted on it, we must have actually been voting on the list of vaccinations. Nope. That last vote was to remove the uh, yeah. philosophical and religious exemptions. Okay. Yeah. I just actually heard today um, UMaine is going to require the vaccine for their all of their on-campus kiddos. So they were talking about how it will more than likely become one of those mandated um, shots for college kids at some point. But that, 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 was, that was just news today. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I mean, the majority of colleges have already done that. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if we're, is, are we at a discussion point with this yet or like? I just, I I, still in a discussion. Okay. I, I just have some some thoughts that I'd like to just sort of share. Um, one thing, um, and I I was going to apologize if they're not popular, but actually I'm not going to. So um, the, <laughs> um, one of the things that I feel like I kept asking last year, and it 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 was always like a money issue or like logistical, but I feel like it's much more accessible now, but, um, you know, frequent and random testing can really be incredibly effective and it is so easy to access now. I don't know what the finances are, but I would say if I just would, I'd really like personally to see a, a year where, you know, um, we had something like a strong recommendation for masking for people that are unvaccinated, but not a requirement and um random uh sample testing and i i don't know the details that go into that but i really i feel like it's a way to try to think outside the box a little bit so we're not just following sort of one set of um you know guidelines obviously if something is mandated we'll have to follow it but if it's guidelines I would very much like to see these kids have face-to-face -face time. Um, as you know, as the board knows, I was a up until you know a couple months ago a board member and a parent of a student. I'm no longer the parent of a student, so I can feel like I can speak a little more freely. But um, it, it just was astronomically difficult on so many levels, and the mental health thing is real. It's so real and um, the learning in all of it and you know and so I I don't I'd very much like us to not go into another year where we are not I'd like us to think as creatively as possible I feel like last year when we went into it we absolutely did the best job with the information that we had which was not a ton you know and so we we made good choices or we made choices and we were able to kind of you know follow up on those i feel like there's a lot more information out there now and um still looking at sort of that original goal of um really actually keeping people alive so the vast majority of people who have you know are are, are more at risk have been um vaccinated they all have you know everyone over 12 has had the opportunity to get vaccinated and i absolutely do not think that we should ask our children to carry that burden again and so again personally i'd like to see us do some um pretty extensive random testing which i think can be incredibly effective um and i don't know i have no idea how to execute that amy i'm sure you're like rolling your eyes at me but um <laughs> So the state has offered um, a pooled testing program. Um, there's a lot to it, so I'll do my best to keep it simple, but cover what I can. Um, 
So basically, they contracted with a company out of Massachusetts called Pico Bioworks, and what they would do is supply us with testing equipment. Uh, we need uh, participation uh, of the least would be 30% per building of students and staff. Should um, I jump in for a second? Yep. So random testing isn't really this is an a, option. This really is no, that's fine. Cold testing. Yeah, that's actually the word I meant to use. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so um, we need that minimum, that threshold of 30% participation. Um, the size of the pool needs to be between 5 and 10. So if you have a class of 20 kids, we would have to split it into two. Um, the kids whose parents consent for them to be part of this program uh, would be uh, would self swab with a Q tip not far back in the nasal cavity, just the anterior nares. Um, they would then plot the specimen into one collection container. That container would be packaged, labeled, and shipped back to the company for testing. The turnaround time is supposedly 24 to 48 hours. Um, it's a PCR test. If that test that the pool comes back positive, then the next day we're alerted and the nurse will have to go into the room to, to use a rapid Binax now on all the kids who participated to identify the positive case. That positive case would go home. The children who participated in the pool um, would not need to quarantine. They could stay. However, the students who did not participate in that classroom and were deemed close contacts would have to quarantine. Hmm, interesting. Well. I, I would love to see us participate in that and I'd love to see I'd love to see our community kind of step up and say hey this is this is one way that we can try to help these kids not have to mask all the time or whatever we end up doing but like you know I'd, I'd like to that that is I think that sounds fantastic we discussed, um, we discussed some of this with um, our administrators yesterday and um, some of the concerns brought up by our elementary principals were it would be great you know the more participants the better uh, if perhaps the participation rate in a classroom wasn't great even half and half then it would be very difficult if half of the class had to quarantine half would remain in the classroom the teacher it would be very difficult to do both it would almost be easier for the whole class to go remote so what would well, so, okay so i have another probably not popular thought and that is actually about the remote piece of it and i feel like if there are people who are wanting very much to not have a mask mandate and i assume that means not sending their kid to school with a mask um there are going to be repercussions if they get sick so I, I don't know. Um, I'm I'm just going to go out on a limb and say I, I don't know that we have the obligation to teach remotely if people are having to go home sick. Just like if they go home sick on any other year, we didn't switch to a completely remote system. So I I, I I'm a kind of a big believer in some personal accountability here and within the families. So I don't think it's fair for people to say, don't require masks, but also teach us remotely if we happen to, you know, get sick or whatever. So um, I'd like us to, I don't want, I mean, that was, doing the remote teaching was a heroic effort on the part of the teachers and the administrators and technology. And if we're not setting up, I know we've got our remote academy, which is great, but we've pretty much said we're not going into the school year with like another remote school year. Like we're, we're not, as far as I understand, we're not planning that. And therefore I don't, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not sure what the right thing is to do, but I think if people are unvaccinated and don't want to take the precautions, I don't, I would just ask how much of that is our responsibility to continue teaching them remotely if they do get sick. Again, I'm sorry, I'm not being going to be very popular here, but it's, I, I just think we need to ask really tough questions and um, 
I feel a little bit like, you know, we, we get a lot of input from a lot of different sides and we do need to listen to all of it. But I think as a board, we need to, we also need to come to our own conclusions and, you know, take some of that. So I, I guess I would ask maybe Sue and Audra, like, you know, what, if we're not offering remote learning other than the academy, you know, we, I don't think teachers should be expected to switch to switch the camera on, you know, because somebody has to go home because they didn't want to wear a mask or they're not vaccinated. Like we can't, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Can I piggyback back a question onto that? So if there is the choice of wearing masks or not, and there's testing, if it was mandatory and all the kids were wearing masks and we had testing going on and this one kid popped positive, right? The whole class is still going home, correct? Not if you're participating in the pool. So it wouldn't matter if they were wearing masks regardless. Is that what you're saying? If, you're, yeah, if right. they're positive, they're going home regardless of a mask or not. Yes. Right? So then you still have the predicament of the distant learning or whatever, whatever it's called, virtual learning, right? Whether there's a mask or not. Yep. So the, the testing that is being based upon these statistics in our area, correct, is being used, uh, the, the PCR cycle testing, is that what you said? The pool test, the initial test that is done and each child does their swab and mm -hmm. person and thing that's the PCR, PCR test. And that's also what the CDC is currently using, right? We're, they're using multiple different types. There's that, we have the Binax now, they're using that as well. So what, if there was a positive pool and we go back into that room, we use the Binax now, the rapid test. Okay on students who participated in the pool. And the positive case goes home, the children who participate in the pool stay, and then any other students in that classroom who are deemed close contacts have to quarantine like last year. So they wouldn't be tested? It would just be sent They home. can, it would be like last year, they go home, we recommend a test, Okay. Testing negative doesn't get so negative. correct me if I'm wrong, but I just read on the C I, on the, I believe it was on the CDC website that they're discontinuing the PC cycle testing because of the high rate of false positives. They're going to be phasing it out within December. PCR testing, yes, PCR testing, and it can't differentiate between COVID and influenza. So if somebody has the dead RNA of COVID in their system and they're also symptomatic, they have influenza, but nobody knows it. Well, I've also heard the common cold. <coughs> pop a positive, false positive test with the PCR. Yeah, so all these statistics that we're looking at to base upon our decisions are being fed with statistics from false positives. And these kids aren't necessarily sick if they're positive. They're what's, what's the rate of serious illnesses of these kids in COVID so far? Because I haven't heard any. That's the issue with it. I haven't heard any. It's a biased, they're only given biased facts. So I'm just, I hate They're not giving facts. <laughs> But the, this really is a board discussion, and I appreciate that. If I put that back and forth, I think the board, if you have questions and you want to ask them, that's fine, board wise. Um, but it's, it is kind of a, and, and the unfortunate piece of it for you, Laura, the good news for you is that you're here and you can have these, and then we have these other folks with public if we can't have the same. Interaction. Sure, Audra, I'm gonna. I will. I'll stop my all of my comments now. But I will just say it sounds like this discussion is one that we have to have anyway, totally regardless of what protocol we end up deciding on. So masks, no masks, everything. We still are gonna have to figure out what we're doing with kids. Kids are still gonna get sick, and they're still gonna have to quarantine, no matter what our policy ends up being. So it almost sounds like that's like a different, maybe a different discussion, but. But Amy, thank you for the information on the testing. I am a big fan and maybe if we can get, um, you know, maybe the best option is for us to try to get as much participation as possible in that and that would reduce um, the potential outage for kids. So. Right. I, do, I do have a couple of things I'd like to add on to that conversation, Denise, is um, going through the Q and A's and things that have been put out about the pool testing program in Maine. Um, there are a couple of things that I would find would be a little bit difficult to work around. Um, it's suggested now that for kiddos in grades one K and one, at least I did find it that they are um, probably able to eventually self swab, but in the beginning they, it needs to be a hand over hand situation with. Um, the person overseeing it, likely the teacher in that room, um, 
and they would have you know have to wear the appropriate PPE, which is like lined out in here. Um, having asking a teacher, classroom teacher, to do that, I feel is a little bit above and beyond. Um, the state has said that they would um, they cover the um, the funding does not cover the pool test administration and record keeping. Um, that's to be done by the school unit. Um, it covers on-site specimen collection and testing coordination support, so that means staff contact contracted through the vendor to assist with implementation, on-the-ground operations, and or specimen collection if requested and if available. Um, so we would probably be looking at, you know, seeing the extent to what they would be able to support, but beyond that, it would we would have to figure out how we're going to staff that. Um, we do still have um, Binax, the access to Binax Now tests as we did last year. Last year, the nurses um, rolled with the scenario. If you show up um, with symptoms during the school day, we're going to be sending you home anyway. If you have you know, two of the lesser common symptoms, one of the major, uh, we would make contact with the parent, ask them if they would like us to test their kiddo, get consent for that. We would do the rapid test, send them home. Um, we would also we would like to be hopeful and maybe further guidance from the state. We could use those tests a little bit differently and maybe not always send the kid home. The kid comes down with a cough and the sniffles. Can we test them if it's negative? Send them back. Not always excluding a child. So that's one thing we'd like to look into as well. Okay, hey, I have I have one last question. <laughs> so. <laughs> If a child has been vaccinated and chooses to come to school masked, but is not in the testing pool, they would still have to go home? If you're fully vaccinated, you do not need to quarantine. Okay. So the people in the pool are not going to be vaccinated people, they're going to be unvaccinated people. It can be both. Both. Yep. Okay. So I'll throw my two cents in here. Um, I've been thinking about it a lot all week, just trying to wrestle with the idea as I keep hearing new news. Um, I think that students 12 and over who had the option of getting a vaccine, um, I'm, I'm okay with them having optional masking for anybody who wants to, but where they had, had the uh, option of having the vaccine, um, you know, that's why I would keep that optional for them. For the lower grades, I was thinking K through five, because that it just about gets the 12 year old 11 12 bridge um i either think that we should have the mask or i think we could say optional if we had remote learning for the parents who aren't comfortable because if it's going to be a majority that aren't masking the people who want their kids masked might not be comfortable with a large amount around them so i guess overall i would say optional 6 to 12 and either have the mask for k through 5 or do remote learning and have it still be optional Do we need to make this decision tonight? No, no. I was just, what I was going, this was just an information session. We wanted to make sure you had the latest information. Denise, to your point about the pool testing, one thing we can do between now and our next meeting, which is August 19th, is send out a questionnaire to families to see what the interest and commitment would be for the pool testing. And we can bring that back to this meeting because that could help guide some of this discussion. You should have said that earlier. <laughs> I think that would be great. And I think, um, I mean, it, it does, like, even though Amy just kind of laid it out very clearly, it's obviously a little bit complex as far as, like, who does what. But if there's a way that we can sort of communicate in that survey, like, this will, like, dramatically decrease your potential for having to quarantine. Um, if you participate so and it will you know that the so I, I think if we can just try to help people understand sort of what the what the benefit is to the child's education um, which is you know in this context our singular goal um, you know that might um, but, but I don't I mean it's a it's a complex system but yeah I mean I think I think that's great I think it would I think it's I think it would be great. My only concern with that is the clerical administration 
time that's going to take, both teachers, if the teachers are watching the swabbing, and then the nurse or whoever is compiling the information, I mean, what if you get a 50% um, population that want it done in a school? That's that's a whole other halftime position, probably. So, I, you know, I think that's why we have to think outside of the box and say, you know, if this is the cost to keeping these kids in school and having them have face-to-face -face learning time and, you know, like an extra half person, I would be happy to, you know, help scour the budget and see where we could come up with that money. But um, I... You know, and maybe I have no idea if this is even an option, but maybe at those K and one levels, maybe we try to, somebody asked earlier, what's the role of the PTO in the school? Like, is this an opportunity for parent volunteers to come in through classrooms on different days? I don't know. I just, I, I'd like us to just try to be thinking about everything that we can do to give these kids this, you know, a return to the education that they need. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? I got one more question. Is there going to be any discussion about uh, masks for sports coming up here in the fall? Well, we're going to wait till later on and talk about that because we got to get a new athletic director first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> the fall sports will be outdoors, so no. Okay. Yeah. Um, Okay, so think about it. Uh, do the survey in the next two weeks um, with parents and talk about it on the 19th. Is that the plan? That's the plan. Okay. That's what we should have. I think all of our compadres around the county will have had their also meetings with their, um, you know, with their with their boards as well. And uh, not that we have to follow the same thing as anybody else, but it will help us sort of inform the information, you know, the vote. Okay. Right. Can I, can Thank I just, you, everyone. Can I, hold on. Can I just touch base real quick on something? Um, I agree with everything that was being said tonight. Uh, I just wanted to kind of get out there that our intent as of right now is school 100% with the kids in their appropriate schools with the same schedule uh, starting at, what, 8.30 for elementary, 7.30 for high school, in middle school, that's our intent for the start of the year uh, at this point in time. Yes, and we will put that in the survey that we sent out, Travis, to make sure that that's very clear for families when they look at the survey. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's been a lot of questions about that lately. And I know we kind of discussed it at the end of the school year. I just wanted to make sure it was voiced and clear to everybody that what our, what our intent is. Now, things can change, but that's our intent. That is our intent. Yes. Uh, I have one other question. Social distancing has not been mentioned again, or, or what? We're not doing that. We're, I believe, we were able to maintain about a three foot throughout. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Can I make a quick suggestion, really quick one? Sure. Um, maybe handle this on a case where kids are sick and symptomatic we send them home and quarantine them and not send home kids that aren't sick just a thought so that's actually one thing that um we still stand the state had supplied us with the standard operating procedure it's it delegates how we determine a close contact and what we have to do with quarantine time and stuff so um it's all laid out in there okay so, so even means, kids who aren't symptomatic that are deemed a close contact, they still have to do the 10-day quarantine from their yeah. last exposure. So you could have one false positive in the whole class. Let's think about that. Mm -hmm. That would not be good. <laughs> it's pretty big. Yeah. And I was just thinking um, outside the box a little bit on this too, with the surveys, Depending upon how the numbers are, if it's like we're split, we could actually maybe have some classrooms that are masked and some that are unmasked. You know, might make parents and children, depending upon which side they fall on, feel a little more comfortable. Yeah, except I think they probably have already done their class placement list, haven't they? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Notes are going, notes are going home next week. Yeah. yeah. That's a thought, though. Yeah, it's not possible. It's just. Makes everything harder. <laughs>
<laughs> and then there's the piece of the typical interactions regardless of those that process and stuff. So. Right. And then the move in. Yeah. How about those switch students that move in? And, yeah. Yeah. But we have dealt with a lot. So right. if things need to come to mm -hmm. that kind of a level, we'll yep. figure it out. Okay. So we'll work on that survey and we'll have those results for the 19th as part of this bigger discussion that we will continue to have. Okay. Travis has his hand up, I think. Was that for um, Travis? No, no, I just, just a quick thing on buses. We got a mask on buses, but do we have to follow the social distancing on buses too? No, no. And we do. We will keep the windows open, the two in the front, the two in the back. Okay, but there's not, nothing about. I haven't even actually heard anything about social distancing. Period. Even the three foot thing. Um, I think. I, I think. I haven't heard anything at all. I'm trying to think that's gone away, but it's just more focusing on the mask from what I'm hearing. Yeah. Well. Yeah, I was hoping it went away. <laughs> we're not being capped at 26 kids per bus or anything like that right now buses are the buses are going in full okay yeah well, i would get rid of the social distancing then. <laughs> yeah all right well thank you everybody lots to think about and we'll talk again in two weeks on that yes. we're moving on all right nomination of our new elementary school assistant principal Okay, we have uh, Sarah Anderson that we are bringing forward for nomination for the assistant principal slash literacy coach in North Berwick. Um, Sarah has extensive experience as a literacy coach and an interventionist and a classroom teacher. All of her work has been at Bonnie Eagle, MSAD6, and she um, has her elementary degree from St. Joseph's College for her literacy master's degree at the University of Southern Maine, and she's working on her educational leadership at St. Joseph's College. Um, she interviewed really strong, her references were great, and uh, she's up for nomination this evening for that, that position. Okay, so you need us to vote on that? I think we'll do that, vote, and then we'll do the vote, just because we have two separate yeah. administrative positions. Right. So yes, please. Okay, so I'm going to do roll call. Is everybody here now? Is Victoria here? She's not. Uh, and you need somebody to nominate. Okay. All right, somebody want to make that motion? Did somebody second it? Yeah. Okay, didn't hear that. Okay, so I'll just do the roll call thing, okay? Uh, Rebecca. Yes. Uh, Kate. Yes. Uh, Stephanie. Yes. Lynn. Yes. Um, Alba. Yes. Denise. Yes. Travis. Yes. And me. Is that everybody? So that should be um yes. That would be eight zero, right? Yes. You're welcome to the team. <laughs> And then we're going to move to athletic director nomination. We are nominating this evening Erin uh, Moore for the director of athletics. Erin has been in our district as the assistant athletic director for a few years. I'm just trying to look at how many years, right? One, yeah. two, one, two, I think it's two years. And prior to that, he was a behavioral specialist here. He was a site manager for athletics. He was a wrestling coach basketball coach um so he's been quite involved at noble high school he has received his let's see graduated from noble high school he received his bachelor of science in sports management from thomas college he received his athletic administrative degree from endicott college and he's in his um, educational leadership doctorate program at endicott college so I just have I have one question. Um, oh, are we going to need to also eventually get an, an assistant? We yes, will. Yes, we will. We'll have to. Know, we'll have to post that after this official vote. Okay. Yes. All right. Would somebody like to make a motion? I make a motion uh, that we accept Aaron Moore for the athletic director. Second. Second. Got it. Okay. All those in favor, I'll run through the list here. Uh, Rebecca. Yes. Kate. 
Yes. Stephanie. Yes. Uh, Lynn. Yes. Uh, Alva. Yes. Denise. Yes. Travis. Yes. And me is a yes. So that's another eight. Oh, for that. Thank you. All right, moving on to other. Do we have any other? Oh, um, I have fun news. Um, Aaron Dixon, who is our district health coordinator, and Miranda Wakefield, who is a health teacher at Noble High School, um, participated in a class last year which allowed them an opportunity, a technology integration class, that allowed them an opportunity to apply for a grant to support um, an innovative idea. They wrote a grant about um, how to, well connected is what they called it, which is how do you incorporate mental health, uh, positive mental health strategies, um, working with students, making those connections in this sort of virtual world that we've been living with in this past year. Um, they received a $250,000 grant. Yeah, look at it. $250,000? Two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Yep. Wow. Correct. Um, the Noble Virtual Middle School and provide counseling services, um, a space actually, like a physical space for them to actually meet on a on a weekly basis. Um, multiple sort of um, just supports and resources for those students, and it's something that can be not only used for those particular kids in the Noble Virtual Middle School, but it can also be um, used for other students throughout the district. So it's a it's part of our pilot program. Um, so I wanted just to let you know that, and uh, we are we'll have fun and we'll show it off to you as we're as we move forward. It's the grant doesn't actually kick in until um, middle of September before we actually are able to start like creating the um, the actual program itself. So it's going to take us this full year to implement, but that works in with the virtual middle school pilot program as well. So it's, it's, uh, it'll be good. We'll, we'll make sure that it's out there for um, everybody to see. And do we have to vote to accept this, or is we good? Uh, you do not have to vote to accept it, but you can if you'd like to. <laughs> well, kudos to them for getting it. Yeah, first. I'll let them know that. Yeah, Aaron did a great job with it. So. Oh, yeah, okay. So we have another piece. It's a good thing that Otis here she's poking me. Um, we contracted with Lynn Lyons, who is a um, LCSW psychologist who has worked um, specifically with our district in the past three years on um, anxiety and the struggles that some of our kids are facing and that some of our adults are facing, all of our adults are facing these days in terms of how to handle the pressures of the world and, and the pieces of um, the struggle with the pandemic, the whole nine yards. We met, Lynn actually came to our administrative team meeting this morning and gave us um, about two hours of her time working on strategies for us as administrators to working with our staff and with our students and setting up um, positive ways to um, address issues in terms of anxiety. She really comes at it from a very practical standpoint, and she talked about it. it she talked about um, instead of accommodations, more like skill building for kids, so that if you have a student who's really struggling, um, instead of providing avoidance, ways to avoid behaviors, more about ways to like help, help that student build skills to become more resilient. Um, so that's just, I'm not doing it justice, but. We also have her speaking with our staff on August 10th. So we have a, a Zoom um, set up for her then. And we also we contracted with her to do some, to provide us a similar um, presentation for our parents. And that's set up on August 31st. Um, so we're, we're gonna be pushing all of that information out, those links out to people. Um, would love to do things in person if possible, but we're just in a, um, it's just everything's a little strange so we decided to go with the zoom aspect so people could come in from home and and just participate and have uh, a lot of good information 
I would do a better job writing this up to send out to, to people, but it's um it's really engaging. She just she does a really nice job of helping us. And it made me I have two daughters, one's twenty one, one's twenty seven, and I thought, oh what have I done wrong? Right? What if, what what could I have done differently for them? So um, it's just it's really about framing how we're working with our children. So And on August thirty first the the parent night she is encouraging middle school and up students to participate as well if they'd like to with their family so that's a nice connection yeah. and i think that's the night before school starts so what better thing can you do on a on the night before school starts right <laughs> try to decrease your anxiety yeah really <laughs> yep any other others i had a question on follow-up from our last meeting in regard to communicating our our uh, equality and diversity mm -hmm. statement and wonder where we were on that um it's, so that's going to be posted on our web page the, yes. the statement's going to be posted on the, our web page and then it's going to be incorporated into um some of the handbooks at the schools we actually spoke with our administrative team today about that, Kate, and, and shared that document with them, and they're gonna put it on all of their own um, individual websites as well that are attached okay. to the district. Great, cool, thank you. Okay, anything else? We do have other pu uh, public input, but okay. like we have a couple more statements that came through. Okay, good. All right. Uh, sorry, let's see. Yeah, hold on. I got myself into a. There we go. Um, so, Ashley Allen of Berwick, um, please consider giving these kids a normal school year and allowing parents the choice of their children wearing masks or not. And. Kathy Sheedy of Berwick, one of the reasons the CDC is recommending masks is that the Delta variant is more contagious than COVID-19. Regardless of whether you're vaccinated or not, you can still contract the disease and spread it to others. I think people need to understand that this is a different strain and not the same strain as last year. The vaccine helps to prevent serious illness, but it does not prevent contracting the disease. I think we need to take what we learned last year and be proactive in preventing the disease. Have hearing that 91% of teachers are vaccinated helps to support people who want masks to be optional. I think if we knew how many students were vaccinated, that would also help to make this decision. This past year taught us that even when students had to stay home due to a close contact, teachers had the capability of connecting with students with remote learning. It was not great, and there was definitely some loss of learning, but it was a way to not lose out on all of learning. I would hope that if students have to stay home due to close contacts or testing positive, that they can still log in and watch the class remotely. I was also hoping that this past year taught us how to do remote snow days. We have technology to do remote learning, and I hope that we utilize that. I will just say to Kathy, um, I think we all are in agreement on that, but it is a little bit beyond us in terms of there's a state law that actually addresses snow days, so we're going to have to work on changing the law. Um, I think it will catch up. It's just a few other things going on that they've had. Right, it's not on the top of their. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Ashley Allen of North of Berwick. I think this is her second one. Anyways, what sh why should the virtual be an option for the parents not comfortable with masks? Why isn't that the option for parents who aren't comfortable without masks? So that falls into the same questions. That is the whole of public input. Okay. Okay. All right, so um, when we meet next, mm -hmm. just so everybody knows, we have the construction presentation first at 6 o'clock, right? Right. Yes. And then after that's done, then we'll st have the board meeting. So we may not start right at 7, maybe a little after that. But you're welcome to come to the construction presentation anyway. But yeah. just so that everybody remem remembers that. Okay, thank you. Good call. All righty. Somebody want to make the last motion of the night? Make a motion we adjourn. <laughs> and a second. <laughs> okay.
All in favor? All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Nice. Thanks. Have a good couple.